the picture of the 10 meter. Okay, good. Got it. This is a picture of the 10 meter softball telescope during CNB about a month ago. And has been used for about 15 or so years to do these millimeter wavelength surveys. Rather than talking about that in our past experiments, I mean, a lot of the really exciting work actually is going on now, analyzing data from the data set we're currently simulating. I want to talk about what comes next primarily. Um, so specifically, these two topics of uh, designing two new cameras to measure the high frequency components of the CMB above the 150 uh, gigahertz millimeter black body peak, uh, and doing some technology demonstration to perform line intensity mapping at millimeter wavelengths uh, on SPT and possibly future uh, CMB telescopes. So what I'll do, assuming my computer works, uh, there we go. <laughs> is uh, give you some sort of very high level introduction to the science we're interested in, talk a little bit about SPT as an observing platform, and just give you a couple of highlights of actually the current work that we're doing, uh, so highlights of some recent science results, because a lot of the work we're doing is super exciting, and uh, many or some of you in the audience, uh, your colleagues, are actually doing this work, so it's great to, to shine some light on it. And then I'll talk about these two new instruments we're developing. SPT 3D plus for the high frequency CMB observations and SPT slim, which is this demonstrator for millimeter wavelength intensity mapping using uh, these new type of spectrometers on uh, uh, filter bank spectrometers. So by now we have this really well-established model uh, of the history and evolution of the universe, which started out the period of rapid exponential expansion called inflation, after which the universe continued to expand. And as it expanded, it continued to expand, it cooled, eventually cooling enough so that free electrons and protons recombined to form neutral hydrogen. And when that happened, the photons that were present in the primordial plasma were able to free stream, basically without interacting throughout the rest of the history of the universe until we observe them today as the cosmic microwave background. So the reason that CMD is such a powerful probe of cosmology is basically because it provides a pretty pristine snapshot of what the universe looked like at this period of recombination, but also because you can, by measuring it, you can learn something about what physics was like at much earlier times. Processes like inflation or the presence of light, new particles that we haven't detected yet, leave their imprint in the patterns of the CMB. And also these CMB photons, um, although they interact very weakly as they travel towards us, uh, they do interact a little bit. Uh, and from the scattering off of uh, ionized gas and their interaction via gravitational uh, lensing with large-scale structure in the late tiny universe, we can learn about uh, the physics of the modern universe as well. So point is, you can learn about all phases of the universe pretty much with precision measurements of the CMB. Uh, of course, this is the famous picture, the famous map of the temperature and isotopy that you've all probably seen from Planck, showing these typical fluctuations uh, of the angular size about one degree in the CMB temperature and isotropy with an amplitude difference between blue and the red uh, uh, patches of the sky of about 30 microkelvin. Uh, fluctuation on top of this three Kelvin black body. But of course, what we're interested in is not what things look like in map space, but the, the power spectrum, basically the Fourier transform of the map in the previous slide, which is shown here, showing the amplitude of those fluctuations as a function of their angular size on the sky. So this is showing both the temperature anisotropy, but also the polarization anisotropy. The CMB is polarized at about the 10% level. That polarization pattern can be decomposed into these two, two polarization senses, uh, what we call the E mode polarization and the B mode polarization, having uh, no curl and no divergence, respectively. Uh, and that's a useful decomposition because it relates to the physical processes uh, that produce uh, these patterns in the, in the early universe. And so, just by looking at the <clears throat> polarization power spectrum, you can kind of get a sense of what. And why we're interested in building more and more CMB experiments bigger and bigger because we want to have more precise measurements, especially of these polarization spectra. Uh, we've measured the temperature basically as well as we can. We've measured the emos pretty well. Uh, we're just starting to have measurements of the beam. And the reason you'd be interested in doing this from the kind of at the highest level of science topics that you can access by performing these measurements, of course, you can learn many, many things with CMB, but if you were to pick like a few that really motivate upcoming big experiments. They would be uh, inflation. You can learn about inflation by looking for B modes on these degree size angular scales in the sky. That would be another spectrum, another line on this plot. You can also learn about neutrino masses by measuring the peaks, the acoustic peaks in polarization very precisely. The neutrino masses affect the position of those peaks and also create correlations between different angular multipoles. And lastly, you can learn about new light particles. 
light thermal relics that froze out in the early years behind the spring um, without interaction. That affects the, the small scale damping tail of, of the CMD. So um, there's a landscape of, of upcoming experiments, basically mapping all the way up for the next 20 years that are trying to do these measurements, both from Chile and from the South Pole. This includes notably in Chile, this upcoming Simons Observatory experiment, which is just starting to come online in the next few years and will observe through basically the end of this decade, as well as projects at the South Pole, such as FPE3G, which I'll say a few words about, which is taking data now, and our sister experiment by Separay, which operates as part of this umbrella organization called the South Pole Observatory. There's also um, experiments that are observing from a balloon and space platforms like Spider 2, which Jeff uh, is going to deploy. I hear very soon. That's extremely exciting. And so those experiments are what we sort of call stage three experiments. And then following that, developing now, but also operating now through 2040, is what we call CMB S4, this uh, stage four CMB experiment, which is kind of the ultimate ground based experiment that you can do observing uh, CMB. So it's basically as big or at this point, as big an experiment as you do from the ground that's technically feasible um, using about 500,000 detectors. Um, and so these are just some pictures of what these experiments look like. Spider balloon payload operating flying from Antarctica, the Chilean experiments, Van Pact and Simon's Observatory. You can see a rendering of what this very large six meter telescope looks like, and this massive two meter diameter cryostat that sits at the focus of that uh, telescope. And then the South Pole uh, telescopes here, Bicep Array, these small refracting telescopes, and SPT, this large 10 meter telescope. CMBS4 kind of takes these concepts to the next level, and we'll have not just one, but three of these large aperture telescopes, similar to what's being deployed for, um, for Science Observatory. And then we'll have like 18 of these bicep array optics tubes. Uh, and the point of that is to have two surveys, one focused on a small patch of the sky for going after this inflation science goal, and then another survey that's optimized for searching for light relics, doing a lot of astrophysics covering something like 40% of the sky with a total of about 500,000 detectors uh, split between <clears throat> all these telescopes, uh, both operating in the South Pole and in Chile across a wide range of frequency bands. So the reason I'm giving you this kind of lightning uh, talk on the CMB state of the art is because I think it raises a question which we often have to address when we're, for example, writing proposals and thinking about you know, whether it makes sense to build new instruments, all kinds of new instruments to build. And, and I, the way I pose this question is, you know, if CMB S4 construction operations are going to last through 2040, um, is there really anything, and that's the ultimate ground-based CMB experiment, is there really thing, anything else new left to do in ground-based CMB, um, any new experiments to build? Um, and I think the answer to this is, is that definitively yes. And what I want to try to convince you of is that one of the reasons it's yes, because new detector technologies specifically what I'm gonna focus on to talk about here, kinetic inductance detectors can provide a, a ability to make higher density focal planes, that is focal planes that have more detectors per unit area. Um, and that turns out to be significantly more optimal for a couple of different purposes. One is these high frequency CMB observations above 150 gigahertz, and the other is doing millimeter wavelength crystals. So uh, really it's new technology um, allows us to access some additional science that can't get or can't get as easily through a project like CMBS4 and motivates doing um, these other projects as well as CMBS4. Um, so we yeah, have project SPD 3 g plus just going after high frequency CMB, SPD slim going after the only way. So both of those projects are going to be deployed on the 10 meter self pole telescope. So I want to spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about this. Uh, SPT is a relatively unique telescope. It's the largest dedicated CMB telescope in the world. Um, that gives it really excellent angular resolution of about one arc minute at 220 gigahertz and has this very high quality surface um, that allows it to observe into the, the sub millimeter. Um, and the South Pole is actually also at an excellent site for doing both millimeter and sub millimeter wavelength observations. That's because the weather of the atmosphere is extremely dry. So the median winter precipital water vapor is in fact a few times better than Chile. And not only is it dry some of the time, it's actually dry most of the time. There are extremely stable atmospheric conditions throughout the entire winter, basically nine months of excellent uh, observing conditions, which is 
better uh, than, than in Chile and other sites in the world. It's really the best developed site for doing these kind of observations in the world. And also the fact that it's located in the pole means that we have this continuous access to the same patches of sky. The sky above us never changes, it just rotates around. And we can do this relentless style of observing where we just make the same measurements over and over for years at a time. Uh, and there's been this sequence of receivers uh, of cameras installed on SPT going back 15 years. And uh, today we have this uh, experiment project called SPT3G, which has 15,000 detectors operating in these three frequency bands between 90 and 220 megahertz, um, which we installed in, in 2017. So uh, the survey we're doing is split into two parts. And so I'll, just, I'll say a little bit about the survey and then just give you two quick highlights of some of the science um, uh, that we're, we're doing uh, and then tell you, give you sort of a laundry list of all the other topics you've been, uh, we're, we're working on with, with SPT3G, but not saying much about them. So there, there are two main surveys here, or two types of surveys. We have a 1500 square degree, what we call main survey, which you can see is designed to overlap with the BICEP3 and BICEP array surveys. The idea here is that our data can be combined with the BICEP data in order to improve the uh, constraints on inflation that the, the BICEP is able to achieve, basically because we're able to use the high resolution SPT data to remove the effect of gravitational uh, that, that um, shows up as the levels. In addition, we also are observing this much larger patch in the, the austral summers when the observing conditions aren't as good. This is what's called the extended survey, shown and outlined in red, which is about another 2,600 square degrees. Um, and the idea of this is we're just adding more area, which allows us to reduce the sample variance and cosmic variance and improve constraints on some of our cosmological, uh, core cosmological parameters uh, in the fit to the, the power spectrum. And so the combined result of the survey, when it's done after these numbers, I think are for six years, will achieve uh, these uh, noise levels uh, in, in uh, units of micro arc arc minute, um, and will ultimately have constraints on cosmological parameters um, most cosmological parameters that are as a little more powerful even than Planck, but largely statistically independent because unlike the Planck information, which is mostly coming from temperature and larger scales, uh, the SPT data is coming from polarization at smaller scales. So the combination will be even more powerful than either experiment. Uh, of course, this is a, I would be uh, remiss not to mention, this is a collaboration of a lot of people. This is a, a picture of us at our most recent meeting in Chicago about a couple months ago from many different institutions. Um, so what I wanna do is just give you, like I said, two quick highlights of some of the interesting science that, you, that we're able to do. Um, and this is just a snapshot uh, of, of two analyses that, um, that I wanna call your attention to. So the first one is our first measurement of the E mode and T mode power spectrum. So this is the analog of the second power spectrum I show you on the third slide of my talk. Um, and what you're seeing here is a measurement of the EE in the top panel, the TE uh, in the, the bottom panel, at different frequencies and across frequency. So you can see that we're measuring um, many of the acoustic peaks of the CMB, and not only that, but we, we also measure it at multiple frequencies and they agree with each other. So this is a uh, powerful kind of cross-check. Hey, uh, could we dwell on this and can you explain this like we're all familiar with this? I, I think a lot of people will not know what EE means mm -hmm. or understand what the cross frequency means. What other questions do you want to ask for? Let's pause. Before I start talking on people. <laughs> so but if they agree, but can you be really successful if they agree? So good, good. Well, so let's talk about what they mean by what I mean by agree. So first of all, they agree with the gray line, which is the fit from Lambda C so model prediction, right? Wait, that's not a fit. It's fit to lambda CDM, not to the data. Right? The gray line is a fit of the data to lambda, to lambda CDM. So did, like, I, did uh, I say that? Well, <laughs> usually we just plot lambda CDM, right? Or, uh, well, but no, in this paper, you're right. You were, you're fitting for the cosmological frame. These were actually fitting. Things. Yeah, usually when we show the thing, it's not yeah. it's just lambda CDM. Okay. So, so lambda CDM has a bunch of parameters, things like the matter powers, uh, matter. Uh, density, baryon density, six parameters. Um, as you vary those parameters, you change the gray, gray line. And so you can use your data to fit, to constrain those model parameters. Uh, that's what's being done here. The different colors are just 
different frequency measurements. Uh, so we have 95 gigahertz map of the CMB. Um, and we have a 150 gigahertz map, we have a 228 gigahertz map. And you can also uh, cross correlate those, uh, compare the different frequency and, and then plot those plot spectra uh, of those maps. And that's what's shown. So um, when I say that they agree, uh, I mean, the data agree by high, at least within the error bars for the land CDM curve, but they also happen to agree, and you can quantify it statistically, the different measurements of the frequency bands agree with each other. So, of course, there's some scatter, but larger error bars mean you expect there to be scatter. Okay. Is a, was a foreground removal necessary for this, or is it just irrelevant at these angular scales? Yeah, so we did fit a foreground model, um, but it turns out not to matter. So, yeah, <laughs> the answer is both yes. It seems like there's a few parts in a low volt pole, like in the tens and it's up to like, I don't know, 250 that isn't measured. Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? It seems like that would really help to constrain this. Yeah, that, that's actually an excellent question. So it's, of course, maybe it's not obvious, but it turns out to be difficult to measure low multiples from the ground, large scales. Um, so we had a cutoff where we didn't analyze the data below about L of 300, I think, in this analysis. We could have gone lower, um, but this is using data from our first season, where actually we only had about half a year of data, with half of the detectors operating kind of at not full performance. Um, so we had some issues with noise at these large scales, and we intentionally removed that, that portion of the data. Uh, future analyses will actually go to the lower level levels. We have heard that you, you say it, it does help. Although it turns out it doesn't help that much because long added measures. Yeah. Excuse me, you started to ask uh, simple questions. What yeah. is EE and what is C? So EE is the E mode polarization. So it's a, you can think of polarization as um, assigning or a map of polarization is assigning an angle to every point on the sky. That's the, it's the direction of the polarization angle. And um, so you have this map that has Bunch of angles on it, lines. Um, you can take the component of that map that has uh, no curl, um, and that's what's called the E mode. So it's, it's just a portion of the, the map that has this star and circle type shape uh, patterns of polarization angles. And then TE is just taking the correlation of that E mode map with the temperature map we measure. Go back where you had all the components with the temperature. The... Yeah. Yeah. So we call the temperature. So you just take the power on the side. Yeah. It, it wasn't clear okay. what is E and what yeah, is T. Yeah. And so if, what if you, we talked about V, but we, yeah, yeah. If you decompose, yeah, there you go. That. Yeah. Okay. So decompose it into divergent terms and curl terms. Yeah, I understand the yeah. emote and emote part. I just kind of understood the this E E N T E right now. Right. 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 So I'm um, watching these pieces. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you for the good questions and slowing me down. Now. Anything else? Okay. Let me know if I should pause later on. So, so anyway, so as we were saying a minute ago, you can use those data to form a fit to the Lambda CDN cosmological parameters. That's what's shown here. These are constraints, contours and constraints on these various lambda CD parameters, baryon density, cold dark matter density, um, and several others. And so the SBT3G data is shown in, in red. Planck data is shown in gray, and the blue shows SBT polar, so the previous experiment. So on the one hand, you might look at this and say, well, you're only doing a little bit better than SBT poll and not nearly as well as Planck. But it's important to remember that um, we're only using less than half a season of data here. Uh, and so with this very, very small amount of data, SPD3G is already more sensitive than four years of data from SPD poll. We now have 25 times more data on this. And so this will only continue to get um, significantly better. And eventually the 3G contour will shrink to basically be the same size or better than the one. So I'm using the power of the new constraint coming from 
the more sensitivity on T or actually by adding a lot more sensitivity in, in, uh, in the polarization? It's the polarization, only the polarization. Okay, and what about on um, B modes are not yet on the table? Uh, we will have constraints on deep modes. Um, they won't be as good as by sensitivity, but we are doing an analysis. And that is because the uh, detectors are simply not that sensitive, they're not? No. It, it's it's most, you know. Yeah, but why can you not? Like, no, it, why can you? So why can you measure B, but you cannot? You don't have the same ability to measure B. That's because yeah. it's a lot, much, much lower signal, right? It's 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 no, it's a, good, it's a good question. In principle, you should be able to measure B, and you should be able to do it just as well as bicep. But the reason why it doesn't work so easily actually has to do with the telescope design. So bicep being small, you can have a shield around the, the aperture of the telescope. So side lobes are very well controlled in such a such an experiment, a small a small experiment like bicep. With SBT, we had a 10 meter primary. You can't build a baffle not easily around a 10 meter primary mirror. And so we have worse low frequency noise, worse side lobes um, in parts. Yeah. Is it concerning at all that some of the like constraints from the different measurements like you aren't lining up as much? Um, no, not at this level of statistical significance. If you actually quantify what the level of consistency is, there's no really serious tension between the different data sets. Okay, so I want to give one other example, um, <laughs> which is a project I worked on actually with a grad student. Um, it's a little bit strange, um, but uh, I highlight it because it just shows the diversity of the kind of science you can do with the, the data that we have. This is a constraint on a particular type of dark matter uh, called ultralight axion dark matter. You can think of these as just particles that are extremely light, like 10 to the minus 20 e, um, which con could constitute the, the dark matter in the universe. And so such a type of dark matter, such, such particle, uh, if it were to exist, would have this interesting effect, time-dependent effect on the polarization that we measure in the sea. So what happens is because the, the particles couple to photons, they introduce uh, what's called birefringence, which basically means that they rotate slightly the polarization um, angle uh, of, of the light that you would see from the scene. Uh, and because, and so that, that rotation angle, how much it gets shifted depends on the difference in the value of the axion and field between when it's produced. Uh, when, the, uh, when the photon was emitted from CMB, basically the recombination when we detected. And it turns out because CMB uh, recombination happens over a long period of time, um, it ends up being disproportional to the axion field value locally at the detector, uh, which oscillates at a sinusoid. Um, and so that's what's shown here is you get these two effects. One uh, is you get a little bit of suppression in the overall amplitude of the E modes, and then you get this rotation at the function of time on the scale of minutes to hours to years. Uh, and you can go by looking at your data at the function of time. You can, can go look for this time dependent rotation uh, and then set a limit on the coupling of the axions to, um, to the photons, uh, basically how strongly the axion interacts with, with light as a function of its mass. So this is what we did. Uh, our results are shown with one year of data in the black line. Um, black line is actually a smooth version of the full limit, which is shown red. And you can see that basically because we have such good angular resolution, uh, we set a limit that's about a factor of four, I think, uh, better than previous best limit using this technique from, from Lhasa. So this is a little bit of a niche and wonky uh, science science topic, but it's a cool kind of novel thing you can do uh, with the data set so diverse as, um, as CMP data. Okay. So, and then I just have this laundry list of all the other exciting topics, well, a few <laughs> of the other exciting topics that people are working on. So uh, people here are thinking very hard about galactic and extragalactic transient sources. You can search for asteroid or look for, look at uh, known asteroids with, with, uh, with SPT and, and learn something about their millimeter wave properties. You can measure uh, kinetic, something called kinetic signals, although which back, and, and many other topics. So uh, it's really an extremely diverse uh, and useful data set. So actually, before I go on, any other questions about the SPT overview? 
So just quick follow-up question on the ultralight axion dark matter stuff. Uh, that M of pi term was the presumably the mass uh, um, that you're, you're trying to constrain. How many years of survey data does it take to get down to say it minus 19? It's a 10 to the minus 19. So the way this works actually is that you don't you don't set a constraint that is in the vertical direction with this technique. You set a separate limit on the coupling at basically every mass, and, and you draw this kind of diagonal line in this plot. So um, we have a constraint. Um, oh, you're saying you're saying how many years does it take to get down there to to ten to the minus nineteen or to larger masses? Uh, right. So that that would be more than one year. So we cut off the survey at ten to the minus nineteen basically because we only use one year of data. So if you were to take five years of data, for example, you would get a factor of uh, uh, you'd be able to go to uh, a wider mass range. Is that just in so far as masses correspond to periods in your data? Yeah. And so maybe longer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I ask one more more question? Then? Yeah. Um, so the way you're observing it sounds like you're kind of like just every summer. Is it this makes sense to do campaigns that are sort of off season to try to constrain different sort of periods? Is that um, either the shorter or longer machines? So we, we use all of the data from the winter season, which is nine months long. And so we could add additional years, and that would give us additional nine months chunks. So I think that's what you would want, I mean, how you would extend it. Um, the way that we do the analysis, we actually analyze the data in chunks of like two hours, basically because that's the smallest unit of time that we observe a patch of the sky. So if you wanted to go to in the opposite direction, um, to shorter time scales, you could imagine analyzing the data differently in sub chunks. Um, that's something we haven't tried just because it's more difficult or you know, more work, but uh, it's not in principle impossible at all. Okay, so let's move on and talk about uh, SPT3G+, which are these high-frequency CMB observations. And so the motivation for doing this is rather than trying to learn something about the primary CMB, the motivation for this is to learn about CMB secondary anisotropies. So this is a signal that are produced in the CMB when CMB photons scatter off of matter uh, between us and the surface of that scattering. There are a few examples here that are partic particular interest for uh, this experiment. One, um, I'll talk a little more about, is uh, Rayleigh scattering. So this is when CMB photons scatter on neutral hydrogen and helium at the red shifts just after recombination, very, very quickly after recombination. That brings in a little bit of additional cotton left information in the CMB anisotropy, basically because you're sampling uh, a different um, red shift effectively later on in time. Uh, and then the other is the KSC effect. In particular, it's something called the Cauchy KSC effect, which happens in a period called ionization. So the CMB photons will scatter off of these expanding bubbles of ionized gas that happens when the universe undergoes this transition from being neutral to being ionized. This happens around the redshift, so we don't know exactly, but six to eight or so. Um, and so it turns out that high frequency observations help you um, with these uh, two. Um, topics. So the tool that really allows us to have better measurements at frequencies is something called the kinetic inductance detector, which I mentioned earlier. I want to spend a minute talking about how this works. I think probably many people in the audience know this at least as well as I do. But the idea is that um, a superconductors, when they're below their critical temperature, have their electrons condensed into Cooper pairs. And so when you shine light on the superconductor, um, those Cooper pairs are broken. And they turn into something called the quantum particles. And the inertial mass of Cooper pairs um, gives rise to uh, what's called kinetic inductance when you put an AC field, like an AC signal, through the, the superconductor, basically because you know they have mass, so they have some inertia associated with them. So when you jiggle them, um, they, they don't respond immediately. Um, and that kinetic inductance um, ends up being changing with the number of quantum particle density in the superconductor. So the idea here is that you shine light on the superconductor, the quasi particles are broken, the inductance of the detector changes, and if you put it in a, a resonator, that's what's shown up in the, the top, um, top right figure, the, the, the resonant frequency, so the basically the frequency at which that dip happens, 
happens, uh, ends up moving. So if you have a way of just monitoring the relative frequency, you'll be sensitive to the amount of light that is hitting the superconductor. And the reason why this is interesting or useful as a detector, it's A, you can build a sensor detector this way, but also B, it's very easy to do something called multiplexing, which is to say you can read out many of these detectors on a single wire by just designing them to have slightly different resonant frequencies. Um, so that's what's shown in, in this example down here. You can, you can design the resonant frequency of the detector to be slightly different, then you just put them serially on a coaxial on a microwave feed line, basically. Um, you can, in principle, address all of them simultaneously, but monitor all of them simultaneously because they have different frequencies, um, which drastically simplifies uh, reading out large numbers of detectors. So just a really, yes. So is there, some sort of, is there a limit to the um, number of signals? Uh, yes, yes. So one of the problems Problems you have is you try to increase the multiplexing factor. So the number of detectors that you have, single readout, is that if you have too many of them and they're too close together, they'll start to collide. Um, and so that practically sets the limit on the number of detectors. It's more complicated than that, but that's basically the main, main effect. So just like a really tangible example of why this matters and how this helps uh, is shown here. So this is an actual, the actual detector wafer for SPT 3G. Which is a different type of detector called transition and sensor sensors. And uh, we don't need to talk about that uh, for this purpose of this talk. But the one feature, and, and they're like the most widely used CMB detector, uh, all CMB experiments are being used. One feature they have is that they require wire bonds to other electronics that sit off of this silicon wafer. So if you look, zoom in on the edge, you'll find that there's literally thousands, like 3,600. Uh, of these little pads, which have little wire bonds that are installed on the edge, and then all this cabling that goes to all this other stuff that hangs off the back, right? And it turns out you can't actually realistically put more than about 1,800 detectors on one of these wafers because there just isn't space for these bond pads uh, on the perimeter. And so that's what kids allow you to solve, essentially, is because you can serially stack up all these detectors and they have slightly different frequencies and just read them out on the same, address them with the same fires. You can make a detector wave that looks like this, which is deployed on the last TNT experiment, which has something like 3,000 detectors. So it has almost twice as many detectors as a 3D, but instead of 3,600 wire bonds, it has six. Uh, and so that enables you to have much denser arrays, many more detectors per unit volume. Uh, and the reason you care, the reason why that's a good thing or useful at all, is because it actually significantly increases the sensitivity of the kind of array that you can build. So this is a um, and this is a toy calculation basically of um, the mapping speed. So how sensitive um, an array of detectors is as you change the diameter of the pixel, but then of each individual pixel, but then add more detectors to keep filling out the constant space. You can see that as you go to smaller pixels. Get more detectors, and that means that you increase the mapping speed, you increase the sensitivity. Um, and uh, so, even though each detector isn't quite as sensitive when they get smaller, the fact that you have more of them turns out to be relatively more important. And the overall sensitivity increased by actually pretty large factors. So, this is just a quick example I pulled from a calculation a while ago. But you know, you can get factors of like a few, three, four, um, which are quite significant. Um, particularly at these higher frequencies. Um, so this, this effect is most pronounced at the higher frequencies above 150 gigahertz. And this toy calculation I've done is for a CM, an example of a 220 to 70 gigahertz uh, detector such as will be used for CMBS4. So, yes. So uh, in the optical, when you make uh, detectors which have more pixels on them, you also have to deal with more cost costs. Between the different pixels, uh, so if you have white source, we'll see ghost images on the looking part the chip. Do you have similar issues now as you're going to do the same thing? Are you referring to the fact that if you make the detectors really small, you end up oversampling, you have correlation? No, and, and literally there's an electronic crosstalk between the different like. detectors. So as you're reading the different parts of it, there's a signal that maps onto some, some of this. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of the, the kids, you do have crosstalk. The primary crosstalk comes from when the resonators get too close together. So you play games by, for example, um, um, 
having more readout lines so you can separate uh, the pixel the detectors more in the frequency space. Um, so there are ways of getting around. But yes, if you, if you have a higher multiplexing factor, the resonators are closer together, therefore. But not spatially across the Oh, you're talking about can you have physical coupling? Um, yeah, at a certain point, that would be an issue. I don't think that for the densities we're talking about, that's that's practically a, a limitation uh, yet. And where is the improvement uh, better above uh, 150 gigahertz? Is there something inherent about the detectors or the technology? Or um, yeah, so it's basically because the size of the airy disk of like the points, you know, airy disk of the telescope and the focal plane gets smaller. Um, and so like, ideally, as you go to higher frequencies, optimally, you would just shrink down all the pixels for, you know, in proportion of frequency, but you can't at the high frequency because you can only read out, you only have 2000 detectors on a wafer. So for low frequencies, because everything's bigger, you're not hitting the limit in wiring on the perimeter of the detector wafer. And so you don't really gain anything by going denser. At uh, high frequencies, you're stuck at that limit of 2,000 detectors, stuck at a hard limit. And um, kids allow you to get around that and therefore stay in the online version. I thought it was because you have noise and combination and combination and you know, kid, and that dominates down to about one. So fundamentally, if you have just a single single pixel of a TES and a single pixel of a kid, we're going to have more noise in the kid where they can increase the because what noise is done with the kid or the... I think what you're saying is just a reason why it's hard it's yeah. hard to make a photon noise limited kid at yeah. low frequencies, which is different from Adam's concern, it's which is how densely can you pack? Okay. If you could make them, how densely could you pack? Right. I think that was the question about the... I don't know, my was in general, like why is like... Oh, oh, you're, you're claiming detector density, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. sorry. Okay. Yeah. And then there's another question technology itself, how yeah, it's yeah. Not possible yeah. to get. It's okay. easier at high frequencies than that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And with the material like this. Yeah. Okay. So we're planning to build a camera um, sort of to extend the survey that we're doing with SPG 3 g So there's a similar plot that I showed, similar slide to the one that I showed earlier. Um, uh, except it's showing the plan for 3G plus. So we're adding three additional bands, 220 gigahertz, 285, 345. So the same and higher frequencies as we have with the existing 3G data. Um, we're able to get to much lower noise levels uh, because of the fact that we have more detectors that arrays are denser and, and more objects. So observing the same uh, part of the sky for the main field, um, which will allow us to basically combine data sets directly. So all of our analyses and forecasts will show you, assume that we're combining and using both the 3G and the 3G plus data. And in addition, we also have a planning this very large extended survey of the galaxy, uh, basically because we can um, <laughs> um, for a variety of uh, uh, topics that are kind of ill-defined at the moment, I, I would say. Um, so that's the overall survey plan. And we'll get some slight improvement in the resolution from um, tweaking the design. And Adam, they said, you know, the 3G plot is actually going after 3G because you're going to have to like scrap what's in the focal plane and put new one, right? That gets to my next. Um... Yeah, it was originally SPG4, uh -huh. like a whole new camera, but then DOE didn't like they have a new object. So 3G plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to what needs to be scrapped uh, in, in a minute. But um, I, just, I just wanted to comment a little bit more on the maybe two comments on science um, that we're interested in here. Um, so this actually turns out this type of information is out to be extremely useful for measuring the kinetic CNI, or kinematic, excuse me, CNI is the way which effect. Um, so it's this secondary anisotropy that's produced when like CMB photons scatter off of electrons that have some bulk velocity relative to Hubble flow. Uh, and so that ends up being produced at two redshifts. First, uh, it can be produced by electrons in galaxy clusters at late times, so relatively recently, which we call the late time KSC effect. But it can also be produced um, when CMB photons scatter off, expanding bubbles of ionized gas around uh, recombination. This is what's called Apache KSC recombination KSC. 
Um, and so it's this frequency independent signal that has the same spectrum as C and B, but it turns out that it's buried under really bright foregrounds. Um, and so what I'm showing here is at three frequencies, the power spectrum at, at high L uh, of millimeter wavelength you measure with fit for uh, these different sources that, that form the, the, the comprise the, the spectrum. What you can see is that the, at these um, high, uh, small angular scales, high multipoles, um, this uh, pink lines from the CID uh, dominate. So if you want to measure the KSD or the blue line, you need to have really good measurements of the, the high frequencies in order to be able to efficiently measure them and remove them so that you can actually detect the KSD. But then this is, we're, you know, we're still talking about this is the pairwise KSD, right? Where no, no, no. This is not not this is way. like individual. So this is like a stacking, or is are the individual? What are we from the power spectrum? Power spectrum. Yeah. Okay. So this is spectral some position with power. Spectrum. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is all the, all each of these different sources have. So this is this is like the KSC signal on the power spectrum that you are you are able to disentangle. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. okay. And completely random question. Sorry, but you know you brought it up. It was that. Uh, is there any hope of actually making some kind of direct measurement of KSC in some clusters? Is that anybody trying to do that? Would like completely? Uh, I think the short answer is I don't okay. know. Oh, never mind. <clears throat> but I mean, is, it, is that you're talking about pairwise KSC? Or? I don't know. Like in the old days, we yeah. thought the signal would be so high that, like, whenever oh. we saw an actual cluster, we'd actually it will be something. Okay. And there's still, um, I think people have given up because we realized photographs. So that's like that actually, uh, and so you need like, I mean, it could almost become possible, but we haven't even like tried to do forecasting because nobody believes anymore. But when you when you do get the high frequencies, you could try to do it. There have been like two claims detections, one with partial. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, oh they were all like constrained for us. All they did was measure the. That was one with time. Nika. Yeah. Yeah. So at lower multipoles, uh, you end up seeing the actual primary CMB. Uh, and so that is much more, that, that's, what's, that's what's shown in, um, in red here in this figure. Yeah. So, yeah. so stops like 25. yeah. But the point is, well, the reason is the KSC has the same frequency dependence as the, the primary CMB. So by measuring the prime, primary CMB, doesn't, doesn't really help you that much now because it's much brighter than the KSC and you have no way of disentangling it. So, right, so quantitatively, uh, how does this high frequency information help you um, and how does it compare with other experiments uh, that are coming online? So Srini actually did this really nice forecast. Your colleague Srini should go talk to him about this plot. Uh, he understands it much better than I do. Um, but basically the, the thing you should take away from this, which is a plot of like, the residual contamination, the ratio of the residual contamination to the expected value of the KSC power spectrum, function of multiple. And what you can see is the black line is A, far below one, and it's much lower than all the other lines. That's saying SPG 3G, the combination of 3G and 3G plus data do much better at measuring the KSC uh, uh, signal than these other, these other experiments. And that's because it has really excellent uh, low noise uh, and maps at high frequency. So why would you be interested in doing this at all? Um, I think there are a few reasons. The one that's most interesting to me is that you can measure something from the KSC called the optical depth. Uh, um, and this turns out to be um, this turns out to be a limiting uh, parameter due to parameter degeneracy is limiting parameter for measuring neutrino masses. So if you measure both the KSC power spectrum and the non-Gaussian part of the KSC, so if you have a really, really excellent measurement of, of the KSC, you can combine the two point and the four point information um, to measure both the duration of reionization, so how long in redshift reionization is lasted, uh, as well as the optical depth of reionization. Um, and what's shown here in the, the far right panel is how that constraint compares with the measurement you get from Plum, uh, which uses or measures tau using a different technique, looking at uh, 
very large scale in those, basically. So the fact that you can do uh, this method with the KSC means you can get a complementary constraint that's comparable to the level that Planck measures tau. Uh, and that turns out to be really important for measuring neutrino masses and actually can improve future constraints on the neutrino masses by something like 40% greater than we do this successfully. Um, so this is one of the main things that we're interested in doing with uh, the 3G plus data. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip the Rayleigh scattering stuff and just tell you about the a little bit about the instrument and some of the progress we made on making detectors. This is a cross section of the the cabin of SPTs. is like where the cryostat and detectors sit uh, attached to the telescope, and you can see the current SPT three G receiver. And so the idea is we're going to reuse all the same objects of SPT three G, but just replace the cryostat and the cryogenic objects. Um, with this new cryostat, you can see that it has these 750 millimeter diameter optics tubes with uh, lenses uh, and then detectors sitting at the focal plane at the far end of those optics tubes. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of what the ray trace looks like in cross section. Um, so it actually turns out to be kind of a weird design. So the central optics tube uh, turns out to be identical to the 3G one, but um, we end up having these somewhat unusual designs uh, for the, the radially outer ones, basically in order to correct the uh, focus, the, the Gregorian focus, uh, and improve the image quality. Uh, imaging, re-imaging the Gregorian focus onto these seven hundred fifty millimeter detector arrays. So one sil uh, six inch silicon wafer sits. This detector sits at the focus of each of these uh, of these seven optics tubes, uh, and these are these lenses are all going to be made with with silicon that uh, has these diced uh, anti-reflective coatings, similar to what's being used for experiments like Science Observatory and another project called Tolpec. Um, the detectors themselves look like this. This is a zoom in of an image that a grad student in Chicago took of detectors they made. And so you can see that the way this works is we have this cross design of the inductor, the actual absorber, which sits at the base of a waveguide and feed horn. The, the two crosses are sensitive to the two linear polarizations of light that are incident on the horn. And you can see that the designs for the three frequency bands, which are shown here, look a little bit different. And that's basically in order to tune the, the amount of the inductor in order to tune the responsivity effectively uh, of, of the detector. And uh, yeah, so, so what happens, light comes into the feed horn waveguide, gets directly absorbed in these crosses, which are the actual inductor, and um, two repairs are broken in that inductor. And then separately, you can see that there are these sort of half circle structures here, which are capacitors. So if you zoom in, they have fingers that, that are interdigitated, and that forms basically an LC circuit that is the resonator of the um, and we're um, preliminary prototypes uh, have looked pretty good. We have optical efficiency measurements like about seven percent quality factors, basically how narrow the resonator is that are in uh, good agreement with our expectations. And we're um, planning to multiply that set of factor of about uh, eight hundred detectors on each you know, line. Is so looking at this, it's um. These are not multi-probe detectors. They're just one. Right. They're they're one color per pixel, or are they one color per wafer? Or do you kind of mix them up? Okay. Yeah. Didn't Toltec have the OMT design? They were trying to say that was no. So both Toltec and Blast have a similar design to this, where they have wavy crosses that mm -hmm. the inductor, and then their lumps all over the place, so mm -hmm. faster than the upside. It's basically a multi circuit. Okay, and then I'll just mention we've actually designed our own readout system to in collaboration with uh, people at McGill to read out these detectors. And the reason I mention this is because it actually works really well. It's like ready to go, uh, which is never the case for readout electronics. And it's kind of cool because we basically took the same readout electronics we used for SPT 3 g a totally different type of detector. And the design is such that we were able to reuse the digital portion of the board. So there's one board that's the, the digital electronics, and then these daughter cards sit on top of that that have the ADCs and DACs that 
digitize and produce signals and control detectors. We will just replace the analog daughter boards with an off the shelf daughter board that has gigahertz ADC backs and make some modifications to the firmware. And this actually works really well and is already our, our primary tool for testing detectors uh, in the lab. And uh, as well, we'll deploy both in SPD 3G Plus as well as in SPD Slim, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, but I guess maybe now is a good time to pause to ask our any questions about the 3G Plus. Oh, I'm sure you have you can't ask a question that really well. Okay. So I don't know if you. Um, the what? The, yeah, in my my new laptop. Oh, I mean he can't. He can't. Uh, he's on mute. He can't. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Try now. Yeah, I I tried to speak earlier, but no no one heard. But that, but that's okay. I, I was just making some trivial <laughs> comment. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have I don't have any uh, pressing questions right now, so you can continue. Okay, okay. I was just that. that's okay. I was just going to say about the, the individual KSZ stuff uh, because I think Nika, uh, the the telescope in France, uh, they did measure the KSZ from a single cluster. There was one massive cluster. That's all. Huh? Nika did. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's go on. I don't have a ton of time, so I'll, I might skip a few slides here, but just to introduce line intensity mapping, which is not measuring the CMB. Uh, it's a technique for measuring large scale structure. And the idea here is that uh, there's a large redshift range between Z of Z above three or so that is relatively unexplored by galaxy surveys, but in principle, you can learn about the expansion of the universe, reionization, star formation by making measurements of these, these higher redshifts. Um, and so the idea is that line intensity mapping is a way of mapping the total emission of a redshifted atomic from what the line. So the line uh, emits at some high redshift. Uh, you observe it basically with a low resolution uh, telescope that has spectral information. So you measure its redshift and then construct a three dimensional map of the uh, emitting uh, structure. Um, and uh, this turns out to be an efficient way to survey large volumes because you measure basically all emitting sources. You don't need to threshold on individual galaxies. Uh, and it's powerful because you can combine information from multiple lines uh, across spectral range from the radio to the millimeter to the infrared. Uh, and it allows, again, to access information about structure at these relatively high redshifts that are harder to sample with galaxy surveys. So there's some interest in doing this. Um, in particular, doing it with millimeter wavelength tracers because there are far IR lines that turn out to redshift into the same frequency ranges that we use to observe the CMB from the ground. Um, so in particular, this um, in this plot <laughs> is originally from Joaquin. Um, you can see these uh, uh, ladder of, uh, of rotational transitions of carbon monoxide as well as this bright C2 line. Um, if those emit at cosmological distances, they redshift, their emission appears at lower frequencies. Uh, and what I'm showing down here is a, a plot of, in the blue, the transmission of the atmosphere. So we typically observe the CMB between these uh, absorption lines of water and oxygen, and you can use them to observe the redshift of uh, far air. The interest of doing that is that means you can basically wholesale copy, reuse a lot of the same instrumentation we, we, we developed to observe this scanning, uh, but to do this line of testing on it. And there are a set of experiments, go by these names, trying to do this with many uh, diverse approaches, different types of spectrometers, different types of detectors. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, and just say, here are some pictures of some of those experiments. People in the room uh, were, have been telling me all about Tim in particular, which you Creating spectrometers, and I think we'll be observing um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen uh, at redshifts between 5 and 1.5. Um, there are other experiments as well, so different types of spectrometers, different types of spectrometers. Some are on the ground, in the balloon, that's uh, very active. So, what we're interested in using is a very particular type of spectrometer called an on chip spectrometer. And the idea here is that you can couple 
an antenna to a filter bank, which is basically a bunch of narrowband filters, each of which is connected to a kid, to a detector, and the filters are all tuned to slightly different frequency. So this has been done, this technology has been developed originally for the project called SuperSpec, which is actually a plot and some data they've published showing a spectral response of one of their pixels. Um, and you can see that they have many of these narrowband filters, they're slightly offset, and that together they form a spectrometer. So each pixel is sensitive to many different spectral channels. Um, and this has really is really just in the very early stages of being demonstrated on Sky. SuperSpec is just now deploying this to do observation on Sky. There's another experiment called Deshima, which similarly uh, has really just done some initial uh, initial observing runs with these kind of detectors. Um, so we formed this project called SPT Slim, which is a collaboration mostly of people involved in SPT, people uh, in the Chicago land area, um, trying to uh, build a cryostat, build a small camera, and put on SPT to demonstrate these detectors and do uh, an initial um, uh, intensity mapping observations of CO. So the idea is that. Uh, SPT can observe because the conditions are good enough in both the Austral winter and the summer. And there happens to be a little spot in our optics inside the cabin where you can put an additional cryostat and another mirror that blocks the light going to the main SPT cryostat and redirects it into this small little cryostat off in front of us, circling in, in red. Um, so this has actually been used before. This, this optics chain has been used by something called the Event Horizon Telescope. One of the receivers in their network is located at South Pole in, in this location. And we're basically replacing the optics and putting in a new cryostat with totally new detectors, but using the same basic conceptual layout of this Hickok mirror and a, an additional cryostat. Um, this is a, a cartoon of, of what the actual focal plane we think will look like. Uh, on the right, this is work that Keith Berry and his grad students have been doing. So it's kind of this funny geometry <laughs> that you have to arrange in order to make it so that you know you have enough space for the filter banks, which are actually surprisingly large as well as pixels. So <clears throat> what's going to be done is this way we'll have you know, fabricate three wafers most likely. They'll be diced in this funny shape, have pixels in the center, and then the actual filter spectrometers uh, around the edge. This is a cartoon just showing that light comes in, it's picked up by these probes that then send it to the filter bank. Each one picks off power that then uh, gets dissipated by breaking the repairs in the genetic conductance detector. And this is a prototype, uh, or a very early prototype uh, of, of these filter banks with just a few spectral channels and a couple of pixels that we've, uh, the collaborators made at Argon. And we've been testing. And we just, you know, so the light is. Uh channel through those filters and it's actually all of those filters are illuminated at once right it's not that you go through each one so it's kind of like a like a coarse grism in a way yeah okay i, I think that's so that's yeah and how many how many detectors can you put like 20 30 i don't know so those are ones in the center these uh, how many pixels yeah i mean how many are, how many lines of sight can you have at the same time there, there are 18 pixels okay. spatial spatial yeah, each of which has a resolution of three in this, this design. Um, and so, yeah, this is just a picture of the cryostat, which is actually the thing I've been spending most of my time working on. Uh, so at Fermilab, we have some engineers who are designing this, and it's locked into this extremely compact location in the cabin where there's beams that really create serious obstructions and make it very difficult to actually fit this in. So basically the entire design of the cryostat and the entire design of the cryogenics Turns out to be driven by the fact that there is a very, very tight space that this has to fit into. And that's what it's called sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. And so, you know, for the experts, we're using an ADR the, to operate this thing, which is a kind of unusual choice. Um, but we have no other alternative to speaking with such small space. And uh, similarly, the optics, the optical design ends up being extremely funky. Um, so it turns out that we originally tried to just reuse the EHT optical design, but the EHT optical design had very, very little field of view, so we could only fit like two or three pixels <laughs> in it. Uh, so the field of view is basically zero. Uh, so we numerically optimized the um, this third mirror, basically, to increase the field of view of it, correct some of the aberration, and also introduce a field corrector, it's cryogenic, in order to make a focal plane a bit larger. 
current design is uh, has a diameter of about 40 millimeters, which allows us to fit about 18 spatial pixels. So working at a number of 2.5. So we've made some forecasts, which you know you probably shouldn't really believe uh, for many reasons. But um, conservatively, assuming that we have something like 50% observing efficiency for four weeks, we'd have more than 300 hours on target time. And that would allow the raw sensitivity that's going to be slim to be enough to stack the steel power spectrum for, uh, for three different transitions at redshift 2.5 and 2. So it's shown in these figures is the, basically the signal we're looking for in blue, red, and, and yellow. So red and the yellow are two components of the blue line. They add up to the blue line. And then the triangles are noise levels for these different um, K modes, essentially, spatial modes uh, for different amounts of integration time. And so you can see if we're able to get 100 to 300 hours, we'll have something like five sigma. Add up all the all the triangles, uh, getting to the level of like five bit sigma of detection on the power spectrum. Uh, but obviously, you should you know, trust forecasts. So I think I'm five minutes over. So I'll end here and just say that we have a lot of really exciting ongoing analyses with the SP3G data set. There's a ton of really diverse science. And uh, stay tuned for the results and talk to your colleagues here who are doing a lot of that really exciting work. Uh, kids enable denser detector arrays. And that turns out to be really important for doing intensity mapping, for doing the frequency of the observations. And uh, SVT is an excellent platform for doing these kinds of experiments with it. That is at PD Slim, which is going to deploy sometime in the next year or two, uh, as well as slightly later time scale SVT. So, Any further questions for Adam, either in person or online? Yeah, looking at your uh, at your detector design for the, I think it was SPT 3G plus, you, you mentioned the two polarization modes that the two meanders are capturing. Is the, is the instrument actually, but your signal is, is temperature. Are you actually getting polar, are you planning to do polarization data? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. Um, the answer is no, there's actually not a lot of science that is interesting to do with polarization data. We have it just because it's, in a sense, the simplest to make. Uh, if you get, yeah, if you're getting good, if you're getting good efficiency with the polarized detectors, that's that's great. Yeah, I've, I've heard from the NIST people that the polarized detectors are a little tricky with kids. So yeah, so far, good. so far they seem to work. That's great. Um, but you're right that there isn't a lot of additional science to get okay. And the, the downside, there is a downside, which is you have to read up. But, but isn't Raleigh scattering sensitive to polarization in the power spectrum? Oh, yeah. That, okay, that's, that's a good point. Although I'm not sure that most of the sensitivity comes I, from the TE. I think, I think it does. Does okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I was just kind of wondering if the factor of two that you're the factor of two additional detectors you're paying by doing polarization you don't strictly need it. Could you have? Do you then have? Could you have gotten away with a TS like density, or are you winning by a larger than that factor of two? Yeah. If that, if that sentence made any sense. Yeah. No. No. It's it's a good point. Um, no. I think, I think we are winning by more than. Factor of two, but yeah. you're right that that decreases the amount. Oh, yeah. Like the whole point of the kids was that you could pack more detectors in, but you're you're eating a factor of two by having two detectors per pixel. But if you want to only do unpolarized science, you would just throw away that factor of two, and then you could have used TSs to begin with. Yeah. So we have, and, and it's that's not quite true, and the kids are still better. Yeah. So so our current design has about five thousand detectors per wafer. So we're not okay. quite in the regime where you could still literally the exact same way out. Mm -hmm. Yes, twenty five hundred is still a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, the design of the three forty five arrays has not been finalized yet. So we may actually push to even more detectors uh, for three forty five. Yeah. Okay. Most of our design of the two twenty. Okay, let's take Adam again. Yeah. Um, I think he might have some openings in the afternoon. I think I'm tired. Well, 
almost entirely free to send people. So yeah, if you want to chat or tell me that. Okay. Are, are also, oh. uh, yeah, sure. sure. Can you go back to the uh, guys who's right now? Uh, you asked Joaquin about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, this was a slightly confusing for an optical observer because we're like brain backwards. And, uh, yeah. So you said uh, it is uh, uh, three hundred and forty euros is one of the, the uh, highest value what I think with the new vectors. So with Slim, actually, sorry if this wasn't entirely clear. We're actually just measuring uh, this band here. So it's about one hundred and eight. And that corresponds to what in microns? Uh, that's that's, that's one, two, more, two millimeters. Or, sorry, well, it's like, uh, two millimeters. Yeah. So that's half that size. No. Remember, oh, this is in the rest frame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then it gets rich. So really, what we do is, I mean, we're just building a detector in the frequency range, we know how to build detectors. And, and then and it corresponds to some redshift. <laughs> and you know, if, if you were trying to do more than a technology demonstrator, just get these things working on the sky, you'd probably think more carefully about optimizing things. But, well, this, but that's the known atmospheric window we're looking into. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That, that's what's the fixed constraint. Yeah. Can, I, can I also ask one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if you think CMBS4 will be interested in, in using SPD 3G plus to monitor high frequency polarized tests, uh, to, to, to basically get that at high frequencies and use that to clean. Sorry, use 3G plus data to clean To dust. clean the, yeah, uh, the galactic dust for CMBS4. Oh, oh, from the for the very wide uh, survey that we're planning with 3G plus, mm -hmm. maybe uh, it doesn't cover the exact same patch of the sky as the as the S4 wide survey, but I guess it might have some overlap with the. Oh no, I'm just talking about the the South Pole survey. SPO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so the remember the, the galaxy is one over FE, so you really want large modes. So we could do exploratory stuff, but there's not like a killer app right now for that. Okay. I mean, same as 4 has bands up to 278 gigahertz, but, but SPD3G plus has a 345 as well. So that, that could be useful, although I think there are some decorrelations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, see you guys in a few weeks. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Srini.